Well, today, parents, moms, dads, no parent, whoever you are, human doings, because we're not just being, we are continue doing, we are no longer gonna cower with courage in the corner. We are no longer gonna fear. I'm gonna give you some tools and just some really good insight into how God works in our lives. So Lord, I pray this morning that as we listen to your word, as we listen, Lord, that we would feel a lighter hearts, lighter heads, and lighter feet, that we would feel more excited about waking up on a Monday and knowing that we can have courage. Amen. You know, there's a, 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 a nursery rhyme, I'm a brave, brave mouse, I go walking through the house and I'm not afraid of anything, and then they say, well, what about a cat? Well, maybe the cat, I'm a brave, brave mouse, and adds all these things by the end, the mouse is cowering in the corner. Well, we're not going there. So we meet Joshua as an Israeli spy. The tribes of Israel were about to enter the promised land. And Moses says, 12 guys, you are our spies. We're sending you into the land. Come back and report. I want to know things like, what is the land like? What are the people like? Are they strong or are they weak? Is there food? Can we farm? Go and bring back a full report. And they returned and the report was mixed. Out of the 12 guys, 10 all said, Ooh, yeah, 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 yeah. But Caleb, yes, good old Caleb, Caleb and Joshua said, this is a land that flows with milk and honey. The other 10 said, there are giants in the land. There are powerful people in the land. There are fortified cities in this land, and it filled them with fear. But Joshua and Caleb were different. They were having none of it. They were quite mad. They reminded the Israelites of God's protection. Caleb and Joshua put on their brave. Joshua knew God was with the Israelite nation, and this gave him courage. It's like, you know, we've got our, our, our teddy bear, we can face life. You know, it gave him courage. God's much bigger than a teddy bear. So Joshua's reliance on God, Caleb's reliance on God, allowed them to see God could go before them. And you know what? It gave Joshua courage. The past gave Joshua courage for the future when they went into the promised land and they were conquering because he believed God was with him. Over and over and over again in the Old and the New Testaments, the message is clear, God does not want us to be afraid. According to Ross, fear not is a really well-used term in the Bible. And God's telling us, fear not, fear not, fear not. He wants us to have courage, but courage comes from relying on him and some handy tools that I'm hopefully going to give you a few of today. So when we have a look at Joshua, we see that he was a man that had the courage to face the giants and overcome the giants because they actually went into that land. Now before we start, I want to make a very clear distinction between bravery and bravado. So some people, they watch with or at people who have bravado, you know? Bravado is a pretense of bravery. It's a show of courage to make people admire you. It's flashy, it's showy. True bravery is often silent. It's in the background, quiet. It's resilient and often without much swagger or confidence. Sometimes just pure grit, persistence and pushing through is bravery. And bravery doesn't mean fearlessness. I love this. I think sometimes bravery means doing it afraid. Even if we're scared, we do it anyway. We don't allow fear to hold us back. Now, some of us are more brave than others, I know. I am one of those souls who I send tend to go in to sort things out, and there's others cowering in the background and thinking, oh, flip, Leanne, what are you on? Okay, I understand that there's some more naturally brave, there's some less naturally brave and some that need to learn to be more brave, and some that need to slow down on being brave, okay? It's the same with our kids, the same with our husbands, our wives, our friends, our family, it's the same with us. Sometimes we are more introverts, some more extroverts, some more melancholy, some more naturally sunny. We all have to put on our brave, and we all have to do it afraid. 
Joyce Myers has just written a book said, calling it Do It Afraid. I think it's come out of these last three years. We've got to just do this life afraid. We are naturally hardwired towards negativity. It's the way we made, don't know why. We all have giants to face in our lives and we all need to be brave to overcome them. And I love Brene Brown, she says, if you choose courage, you will absolutely know failure, disappointment, setback, even heartbreak. That's why it's called courage and that's why it's so rare. So I've asked Ross to share. Ross is parenting two beautiful young girls at the moment. And I've watched little Emily, my granddaughter, grow up, and I think she's pretty fearless. I'm like, oh my gosh. So I asked Ross to share something this morning. Hello, hello. Have you put it on? Is it on? Have I put it on? Yep, on. Hello, there we go, ah, there, there we, we go. go. It was my fault, Tim, not your fault. So uh, Leanne just gave me, I think it was 30 minutes, about, it might have been 30 <laughs> seconds just to say this, but... So, so Leanne asked me, she, there, was, there was a couple of questions she said, like, what, what, how do I define bravery? And, and I think the main thing that I define bravery as is running towards fear. Like, I think, I think it's not that we are unafraid, it's that we run towards our fear. It's, it's doing things that we're not, that, that we're, we're scared to do. Um, and as far as, the other question was, how, how, how do you try and teach bravery to your girls? And... I think the main thing for me is that I, I'm, I try and be as vigilant as possible, uh, possible about um, fear in my life because I'm actually underneath everything, I'm a deeply fearful person. Um, and I, I can't actually teach something that I'm not, uh, I'm not. I can't teach them something that I'm not. They're going to learn by watching me. They're going to learn and they're going to adopt my fears and, and insecurities. So, so the first thing was to try and root it out. And, and there's, a, there's a quote, um, it, it comes from a, a Dallas Willard book, and it, and it says something like, um, the world is a perfectly good and safe place to be. And if, if, if you just digest that for a second, that's, that's quite a revolutionary kind of statement, that the world is a perfectly good and safe place to be. And so I've, I've taken that on, that's my, that's my motto, and I'm, I'm trying to be vigilant and root it out of my life as 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 often as I see fear coming up, creeping into, into my life. Um, the second thing was that, I, like, so I think, it, I think it was Roosevelt who said that uh, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And I, I really do think, like, the, those giants, like, it, it does depend on your perspective. But, but fear is the thing that actually that debilitates us. And, and I, like, I really want to try and root that out of my life, but for my girls, I want to make sure that they live their lives to the full. I don't want them to live half-hearted lives, wishing that they had done something, but, but they were too afraid to do it. I, like, I, that's the last thing I want them to do. Um, and I was thinking, like, I, I actually wrote out a little thing here that said, the, the world is full of pain and death, and, and, but if don't be afraid is one of the most repeated phrases in the Bible. And, and, and pain and suffering are all around us, then God must have given us a way to not be worried about pain and suffering and death around us. And that, and that there's some things that are wor worse than pain and suffering and death. And I, I think the worst thing is that we would not reach our potential. We wouldn't be who God created us to be because we're afraid of of living, and, and that's the thing that I most want to root out. And just the one last thing is that, that I was just thinking practically, like w the other day, um, Emily was up on the, on the roof of our uh, outbuilding, enjoying the view, and Kate wanted to go up onto the, onto the top. And so, and I could see she really wanted to, but she was too, too afraid to go up the ladder. So I, I, I think being a, a parent, is, it's a balancing act between, between pushing them past their fear and giving them uh, safety and knowing that they're safe. And, and so I, I just came up behind her as, as she was walking up the ladder and I just, like I made sure I was close to her and I just, as she was walking, getting up high, I could feel the, 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 the stress levels rising and she was sort of slowing down and, and getting small. And I said to her, no, just don't worry, you look, you're, you're almost there, just keep going. And she, she kept going until she was actually on the roof. And I, 
I think that's the same with God. He's always with us, whispering, saying, don't worry, I've got this. You're okay. Just keep going. So, Thank you. Thank you. I'll give it back. Well, Ross is on the ground as a, a parent, and I thought it would really be good because I've watched, and um, Ross, I commend you and Mish on raising. So far, we see it in M. Kate, to be decided. Okay. So, um, we, it, one of the first things, there are two obvious ones on courage, and the first one is don't tell your kids to be careful. When we say be careful, we automatically saying the silence, there is something to be wary of, there's something to be afraid of, you might not do this okay. Instead of allowing them to enjoy the adventure or the event, I would suggest, like Ross did, great example, Ross, thank you, to look at the task and then speak it out with them. How do you think you can do this? What do you think you can do? How do you think you would, and, and then speak it through them? Because a less adventurous person, if they're told continue to be careful, they're going to go to their default where it's safe and sit on their bed or sit from the sidelines or do something. We want our kids, we want ourselves to be in the race, part of it, loving life. Secondly, you are their example. They mirror you. So let your kids borrow your confidence. Mirroring or social referencing, as psychologists called it, Ross just mentioned it, kids look to see their parents and they say, should I be scared now? If you cry, guaranteed they will feel unsafe. Guaranteed that, that courage will seep and just move out of them. When our kids are scared, we often instinctively want to put our arms around, we want to protect them from possible harm, prevent suffering, and help them escape the scary situation. But this tells them it's too hard for you to handle. You can't cope. Instead, you should tell them it will be hard, but you can do it. Anxiety is contagious, and often problem children get labeled irresponsible, problem children are fragile, but psychologists explain this pattern behavior a response to anxiety. So if we practice calm as a parent, it's also contagious. Anxiety, calm, both are contagious. It helps the kids, the adults, our partners, everyone around us to get emotionally grounded. And I'm going to give you three keys to remaining calm. The first one is slow down the conversation. This is a tool. You know how things, I talk fast when I'm stressed. Slow down the conversation. And then tell the kids, Brett's favorite one, breathe. Okay. And then fact find. And if necessary, repeat. Slow the conversation down, breathe, fact find. And repeat that, and repeat that until I can do this. You see, we need to give our kids, spouse, our friends, ourselves permission to fail. I'm da, 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 da. Okay, it's okay. Breathe. It's okay. Slow myself down and look at the facts. I know for a fact that uh, if we do the brave thing, even though we may feel really small, we did something much bigger. No one else would see, but we can feel so small, but when we're brave, we have done something huge. I know for a fact, talking about mirroring, when I'm rattled, a couple of Mondays ago, I came in, I hadn't had much sleep, I was just stressed, Brett and I, we've had stresses, there, there was a whole lot of stuff going, and I know I came in here a force, like, and I could just see, and I felt that ripple effect on everyone that was in the cafe working. My rattle became other people's rattle. Anxiety, rattle, all of that is contagious. So I have to say to myself, Leanne, slow the conversation. Breathe, fact find. Okay. Now the next two points I want to dwell on a little bit longer. And the first one is how we develop intuition. And the second one is our process. Now first of all, we need to develop intuition as an adult, we've developed some, a fair amount of intuition, but our kids are only learning. And we need to learn to trust our intuition. And I can only really say it's that gut feeling. It's that gut that we have. If we were to define intuition, it's a form of knowledge. It's our hidden wisdom. It's formed from our beliefs, 
our experiences and our memories. That's what intuition is. And this enables us to make decisions on our feet as we're going without analytical, deep thinking. The more we develop this intuition, our hidden wisdom, the better we become at healthier decisions under the right circumstances. Swiss scientists found that this gut feeling is actually heavily influenced by our vagus, not vagus, what's going on in vagus, V-A-G, our vagus nerve, there's no gambling going on here, and this vagus nerve is the longest of its group and it sends messages from our stomach via our heart to our brain. Stomach, heart, brain. That's where the gut feeling comes from, stomach, heart, brain. And it's an important part that makes us courageous is when we act on the gut feeling, doing what is right, even in spite of social media, in spite of what people are saying, in spite of the noise around us. Joshua, there were 12 spies. Two of them went on their gut. They went on their belief in God, their memories, and their experiences. If God did that then, he will do that now. They went on their intuition. They used it. Because same 12 spies, same land, same, same tour, what goes on tour stays on tour. They did it all together. But two used that gut and said, even though they are giants, even though there are fortified cities, their belief, their memory, their experience came through and they were able to make a good decision under the right circumstances. So we need to encourage our kids and ourselves, self-talk, to mentally note when something feels right or wrong. Don't override that feeling. Now, addendum to this, people who have been, had very traumatic childhoods and been abused, their gut feelings can hijack them. I understand that. Their gut feeling, they get triggered and they want to run and whatever. I'm not talking about that. That's a whole nother event, isn't it, Gabs? That's a whole nother area. I'm talking about our children right now that we need to allow them to mentally note when they feel something's right or wrong. And then you say to them, when you feel like this, or when you are quiet, what does your heart tell you to do? Stomach, heart, brain. Do you have a feeling about what you should do? Get them to trust that gut. And sometimes those feelings become such a part of you and it knows what's best, pay attention to it. Pay attention to that. The second one is process. And this is so vitally important. Vitally important. You see, we live in an immediate world. We don't need to go to the library. Do you know when I wanted to find out, when I was studying botany and zoology, I had to go, my university professor would say, these are the readings available in the reading room. We'd have to walk to the reading room, wait for the book, book that reading, come back at that specific time to read it. It was too valuable to leave the reading room, make my notes and go home and then put it into the final thing. And that, that sometimes took three to five days. Now people can lie in their bed on Google. All roads on, on Google lead to cancer, just uh, T's and C's, okay? So now it's immediate. We send a message to someone. Do you know that snail mail? We are waiting for our father heart account, Lloyd's account, snail mail. The average time it takes to get anything from Lloyd's in the UK is three to six months when we're waiting for stuff. Snail mail on steroids slow. Email, just think of it. I want a document, I email, boom, have you got it? While I'm on the phone, you got it, okay, great. Immediate. I send a message. I send Ross a message. Don't send Ross a message and Michelle over message over the weekend, okay? And then I wait for the two blue ticks. No two blue ticks. Why aren't they reading? Are they mad with me? What, da, da, da. And there's a whole world that goes into no appearing of two blue ticks. It's immediate. Blue ticks, no reply. Oh, flip. What about, oh, gosh. Hey? Yeah. We live in immediate, we tap our fingers waiting. I personally, Leanne, Nixon, James, who I know I'm together and I run and I go and do things, I got so exhausted and over this craziness that I took up sourdough baking. Now, if anyone knows sourdough baking and anyone who knows my baking record, they just, they like two different worlds. 
and my family, like, Matt said to me the other day, Mom, I never thought I would love the smell of baking in your kitchen, and I never thought I would look forward to it. Okay, he is deeply scarred. His intuition developed young to say, don't eat your mother's baking. That gut response was good. So, people, they can't believe and they are surviving my baking, but sourdough loaves take a full 48 hours to make. It's a process. You feed Sophia. She's called Sophia. I feed her. I speak Italian to her. I leave her out all day, I go and check on her, all right? Then when Sophia has decided to stretch and do all her beautiful things, I then do the next process by adding Tim's beautiful sourdough recipe. And then there's a lot of massaging and caring and talking and whatever that goes into making Sophia's children beautiful. And then into the fridge. And then the next day again, there's a whole process. And eventually into the, <clears throat> excuse me, into the oven. Godswell's now a sourdough addict. He loves my sourdough, hey? Eh? He's still alive. Okay. So you see, but every time I put that sourdough in the oven, I have no idea how it's going to come out. With my baking especially, there are no guarantees. And so let's go and think of life. So often the fear of failure makes us a non-starter. You can't bake here, no way. We feel we need to play safe. We and our kids, we, we become so focused. Remember they're mirroring you as well? So all of this, we're trying to teach our kids, we're trying to teach ourselves. It's very, very exhausting. Okay, so now the, the end result is that I'm so scared I'm going to fail there, I'm going to be a non-starter. I'm not even going to go there. Why fear has already robbed me of anything. We lose the process of getting there. I believe truly, I want to tell you something, I truly believe it's not the outcome that matters, it's the process whereby you get there. And I want to spend quite a bit of time unpacking this. You see, what we see modeled all the time is win at all costs. I'll never forget, Matt sat down with his water polo team in matric, and they were about to win the tournament. And Matt said a thing we had always taught him. Guys, we have to remember things. It's not whether we win or lose, but how we play the game. Well, did he come out silenced? No, Matthew, all that matters now is winning. And he thought he was giving this amazing bit of encouragement. Well, boy, nobody wanted to hear that. They wanted to win. Okay? Success, glamour, prestige. I am shocked at what the, the comments, uh, the other day uh, someone said, go and have a look at this, and I went to have a look. There was a woman, a person who's an icon, a fashion icon, a person who's well known, a celebrity person in South Africa. They were being condemned for not having a flashy enough house, for not having the latest and greatest. Her, these followers were criticizing because her new house only had four bedrooms. Her, and I looked at this and I thought, wow, that's an outcome. People, how does she get there now? More pressure to get that. What is her process going to be? Well, how is she going to get that? Because these are the people that are, she's got to live up to this. So you see, we see modeled success, glamour, prestige. I made it, but how did they get there? What was the process? We have to encourage our kids, and this is a time where we have to self-talk. Leanne, Okay. We need to shift our focus to the how and the why and not the what. How will I get there? Why am I doing this? Not what I need to achieve, the latest and greatest, the this, the that, whatever. You see, the process of the why and the how will influence the decisions we make, the actions we take. We need to make honest calls in this process. We need to tell the truth in this process. We need to stand up for the truth in this process. We need to stand up for justice. Justice is no longer really fashionable. Seriously. It's an outdated thing, and I hear people saying, it's your truth, and not to me, truth is black and white. You either did run over the dog or you didn't. It's, it, it, it's, it's simple for me. We cannot know the outcome. It's impossible. Right now, we don't know by tonight what's happening. We don't. We don't know the outcome 
of whatever's happening. In our process, we cannot know, and we don't know, it's like my baking, every time it's finger crossing, come on, you can do this, girl. Sophia, come on, all right? Brené Brown says, being brave is having the courage to show up when you can't control the outcome. I love Brené Brown, she's so real. So if we teach ourselves and we teach our kids to put our brave on, we become courageous in our outlook and in the process. Changes everything. We become brave in our attitude. We become braver in our actions. We are strengthening equality from inside out. The world we live in now works from the outside in. I'll never forget saying to somebody, you need to take these vitamins. She said, they're really expensive. You won't see the effect. And I thought, but you will feel the effect. No, no, it can't be seen. Too much money spent on something that can't be seen. And I have to tell you, as we strengthen this quality from inside out, often, often the outcome isn't quite what we had hoped it would be. Sometimes it isn't. Sometimes we're really happy with the outcome, but not always. So regardless of the outcome, putting on our brave means a couple of things, and you can add kindness, empathy, speaking the truth, acting justly, and so you get the feeling, you get what I'm saying. Now there's a biblical example, there's Abigail. Now Abigail got the process right, had no idea of the outcome. Old Testament woman, your, you, your husband dies now, you basically got nothing unless somebody in your family will come and sort you. You now normally have to resort to prostitution to live. Women had no say. They, they didn't. I've been re I was reading the other day in Esther, you know, the guy says, woman, keep her in her place without any words. I mean, woman had no nothing, okay? And here was Abigail, a beautiful, intelligent woman married to a wealthy, boorish man, Nabal. Now, Nabal was a chop. No other way to explain him, okay? And so David and his men are coming through. They're doing their whole pathway of as they're going and conquering and looking and sort of sussing out the land. And they send a message to Nabal and say, can we please, you've got lots of, you shared lots of sheep, you've got lots of meat. Could you share some of that with us? And Nabal says, who on earth does this oak think he is? No ways. We are not helping. Refuse. David now is mad. Okay, so he gets his guys, he says, right, we are off, we're going to kill this guy, his whole family, they're not even going to be left standing, there's nothing, I am so cross. And as he's on his way, the messengers tell Abigail, flip, this is what your husband did, this stupid man, they didn't say stupid man, but they intimated it, he went and he's angered David, David's going to come and wipe your whole family out. So Abigail thinks, oh my gosh, oh, flip, I got it, so she gets, sends a beautiful feast on her head, David and his guys, stop, guys, meet and food, and you're hungry, they stop, they're eating, they know, okay, so number one, good, she's using, she's brave, she's a woman, she goes on her own, and she walks in to them, also with more gifts, probably with all her slaves and servants carrying all of these gifts, and she goes before David, he is a warrior, he is a fighter, he is a person, he's a man, but she doesn't, she is, she puts her brave on, her process, and she knows she's got to sort out the truth with him, tell her the truth, and she says, I am so sorry if I've offended. If we've offended, we are so sorry. We know we should never have done that. Did a long story short, David says, gosh, I hear you. You're, we will turn around and we'll go home. Whew. She goes back home, tells Nabal he's so mad, he has a heart attack that night, is paralyzed and dies a few days later. He's, good. he's so mad with his wife, okay? David hears about this goes past the next time and he says, right, you're going to be my queen, come. And he takes her, he marries her, and he makes her his queen. Now, I can tell you, when Abigail left, she had no idea of the outcome. She put her brave on, she fought for her family, she knew that she had to make sure she saved her family, but the outcome was pretty good. You see, Romans 5 verse 4 says, endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. Friends, we need to endure in this world. We have to go through the process, but we've got to do the process right. The more we do the process right, the more our intuition develops, the more we trust God, the more we are courageous, the more we will live in liberty and freedom in this crazy world. 
So let's teach our kids and ourselves that there is endurance, that there's salvation at the end. And I mentioned something very important, kindness. Now, all of you, somebody is watching you all the time, no matter what. If it's not your kids, if you're not a parent, somebody's watching you. Are you showing kindness? You know what? Kindness is key to this process. Kindness is always a choice. We never have been forced, we never forced to be kind. It's love and action, it's a smile. Ma uh, Brett gave me this thing, a man jumped off a bridge, committed suicide, and in his suicide note, left at home when they found it, he said, if I am not here, I walk to the bridge, and if one person smiles at me, I will turn back. Kindness is a smile, a comforting touch, an act of compassion, care, concern. It can be big or small, loud or quiet. And there are always alternatives to kindness, always. We can choose anger, apathy, convenience, blurring the lines of truth. There's an element of truth, like a little bit of salt. We salt it with some truth and we elaborate with a whole lot of imagination. Turning a blind eye by looking the other way, denial, that's all easy. Kindness is a choice. Love is a choice. Kindness takes putting on your brave, especially when that person has been awful to you or the situation is insurmountable. We can take it out on our nearest and dearest. I know, poor Brett, when I'm upset, ha, oh, kindness, and I just, and he says, what did I do? Hey? Process. I'm a work in progress. <laughs> Don't laugh so loud, Brett. <laughs> you know why it's courageous to put kindness on? Because it goes against the noise of the world and what's normal and what's easy in our world. It's easy to have road rage. I have to tell you, my road rage has diminished totally since I've slowed down and breathing. And I keep on saying to myself, I love the, uh, what is it, the enthusiasm and the, the, the inventive way taxi guys drive. Okay, <laughs> so I'm looking at it a different way. I'm looking at it a way. So, um, sorry, I've lost my place here thinking about these crazy taxi drives. So, often there is no applause or fireworks for kindness. And we need to tell our kids that. Don't look for somebody praising you, okay? But when our actions are driven by courage, there will always be a difference in the world around us. Always. It may be quiet. There's still a difference. Now, important note to side here, also be kind to yourself. Often I hear myself saying, Leanne, come on, man. I would never speak like that to someone else. Never. I'm speaking to poor Leanne like that. We can sometimes be harder on ourselves than anybody else. So note to self, also be kind to yourself. For us to be brave and courageous, we must teach our kids their value. Like me talking to myself about teaching. No, we as adults must recognize our values. We all have strengths. Harness them. Talk to your kids about what you see as their strengths and how they can work this into the journey. Do you know you often, you know when someone says, I'm watching you? Well, I'm going to say, out your kids for doing the right thing. Out your mates for doing the right thing. Stop collecting bad behavior. Say, I saw you. I saw you, God. Well, I saw you being kind and caring to that person. I saw you, Quinton, stop and help that person. I saw you. I'm watching. Catch out people doing the good. Because in that way, sometimes people think, oh, they'll do it more. Process. The process is important. It also teaches us to lean into our gifts. The world needs our gifts, people. They need our gifts. The world needs us with our brave on. And one strength I truly believe needs to be nurtured in this crazy world of fake news and fake narratives and everything that's easy is truth-telling. There's not shades of truth. There are not 40 shades of truth. There are not polished up versions. There's the raw truth. Let's keep the process clean and tidy because if we tell the truth and are truthful in it, it's easier to live with the outcome. Imagine if the outcome isn't quite what we've done and we've blurred the lines and we've caused chaos in the process. We have to live with that and the outcome. 
If we have been kind and honest and gracious and empathetic, I may not like the outcome, but I can live with myself and I can live with the outcome and I can put on my brave and continue in the process until there is a better outcome. Are you with me? Do you understand that? It's so important. And then finally, Ross mentioned this, we need to normalize fear. Fear is normal. It's pretty average. Um, I said that a book has been written, Do It Afraid. You see, if we allow this fear to become something that overwhelms us, it leads to anxiety and a total dissolving of bravery and courage. It's the opposite. So let's tell our kids and ourselves, self-talk, go talk in the mirror. This will be hard, but we're in it together. Leanne, you and I, we're in it together. We're in this together. Or tell your kids, I'm here, or your spouse, I'm here when you need me. And no, keep true to yourself, your values are this. Keep on. Don't tell, you, tell your kids not to be afraid. It's normal. Fear is normal. Tell them, you know it's difficult, but we can harness our fear and we can do it afraid. Fear doesn't need to stop us. There are no easy outs. There are no simple answers. There's no Botox in the process to plump it out and make it look all good. Don't give up. Keep on keeping on. I love it. For, uh, after the last few years, my favorite saying is, it is what it is, and I'm going to keep on keeping on. You see, we need to move through the uncertainty and fear, and we need to choose courage over comfort. Courage over fear of failure. Courage of a feeling totally prepared already. You know, I'm, 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 not, I'm not quite ready. About what people will say, what everyone else is doing, who are they? They said it was okay. They doing this. They going there. They, I still want to meet there. I'm, 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 I'm getting, I've never met they. Tell yourself and your kids, recognize your emotions. and enables us to feel our emotions. And if we are overwhelmed by them, slow down the conversation. Breathe. Find out the facts. Psalm 27, 14 says, wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently. It doesn't say run off, ask God, and then, and then, and then, and then be strong and courageous, run off. It says wait patiently, be strong and courageous. And sometimes that is the hardest thing. So I've got three scriptures that I'm going to leave you with, and we're going to put them online this week as well, for you to put on your brave. Okay, 1 Timothy 1 verse 7, John, 1 John 4 17, and Joshua 1 9. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. That's what he's given us, and we get to be courageous with God, with the Holy Spirit, helping our intuition. There is no room in love for fear. That's 1 John 4, but this is the one I want to tell you. Joshua 1 verse 9, I want it to be our marching song for this week. This is my command, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. It doesn't say don't fear, don't be afraid. We still got fear, do it afraid. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wherever you go. The Lord your God is with you. So come on, people. It's Women's Day. Women, let's be brave. Okay? Parents, be brave. Men, be brave. Let's be brave. I truly believe that this could change the way we do life, putting our brave on. And at the end, they'll say, oh, flip, I missed out on that one. But I was true in my process.